Let's talk about Riemann sums and the definite integral. The plan is to define the notion of a Riemann sum. And to do this, we're going to need to define partition of an interval and sampling arguments. Taken together, these will constitute what we call a decorated partition. We'll explore how a Riemann sum approximates signed area under a graph, and we'll think about what kinds of partitions are suitable for good Riemann sum approximations. We'll learn how the definite integral is defined as a limit of general Riemann sums. So let's start with the goal of approximating the signed area under the graph of f on the interval from a to b. We ask what ingredients do the job. The first ingredient we'll need is a so-called partition. Now all this means is that we'll chop the interval from a to b into smaller pieces. In this case, we've used six subdivisions or six subintervals. Now just to make the notation uniform, we could relabel the endpoints a and b. In this case, we'll call it x0 and x6. Now the next ingredient is what we might call sampling arguments. And what we're going to do is we're going to choose one argument from within each subinterval. And this argument we will plug into the function to obtain a height, which we will then use uh, when we calculate areas of boxes. So these are the arguments at which we're going to sample the value of f. Now one of the ground rules is left or right hand endpoints are OK. So within a subinterval, we can pick a left or right hand endpoint. So here, for example, is a typical collection of sampling arguments you might choose for this partition. Once we have our sampling arguments, now we plug them into the function to get some heights for rectangles that we base on the subintervals themselves. Now we can multiply together the heights and the widths to obtain a so-called Riemann sum. Let's concentrate on a general rectangle for a moment. If the endpoints are x sub k minus 1 and x sub k, and our sampling argument is x sub k star, then when we evaluate f at the sampling argument, we get our height, and we can subtract off successive neighbors here to get the width. Now you should just be aware that for a general partition, these subintervals are allowed to vary. In other words, delta x is not necessarily constant. To reflect this, we better use notation that indicates that delta x is a function of which k we're talking about. But this is a little bit cumbersome, so we're going to drop the parentheses and we'll just use delta x sub k to denote this difference between successive endpoints. Now, we notice this is actually a signed area because if the function value happens to be negative, then f of x sub k being negative means this product will be a negative number. So when you see a Riemann sum, just notice that when the function dips below the horizontal axis, then your boxes that are based on those subintervals, those are going to contribute negatively to your Riemann sum. The ones that lie above will contribute positively. So here's a very graphical picture of our Riemann sum. And with our new notation, we can make the sum look a little snappier. In fact, using sigma notation, we can, look at, we can make it look very compact. Now, there are a few special types of Riemann sums that you see all the time. If you use equal subdivisions and you use sampling arguments that come from the left-hand side of each interval, then you get a so-called left-hand sum and using equal subdivisions and choosing the right-hand endpoints as your sampling arguments gives you, not surprisingly, a right-hand sum. And of course, there is another obvious alternative, which is to use the midpoint of each subinterval, and you get, not shockingly, a so-called midpoint sum. So let's look at some more examples. And for this, we're going to use the resource GeoGebra to help us examine just how exotic partitions and Riemann sums can be. So we'll take a function f in an interval from a to b. We'll chop it up into three subdivisions. We will choose our sampling arguments, and we will relabel the endpoints also. And now we're going to write down the Riemann sum, and we're going to let GeoGebra actually calculate it for us. And in this case, our midpoint sum is about 60.84. Now this dynamical sheet allows us to actually drag sampling arguments around, and if we drag them all to the left, we get a left-hand sum. 
And of course, we could drag them to the right as well to get a right-hand sum. And what's cool about this is we can drag things around willy-nilly to get all sorts of interesting Riemann sums. We can even drag the endpoints around to get irregular partitions. So now the partition widths aren't even uniform. All this is meant to indicate to you that Riemann sums do not need to be at all regular. So you can get very exotic looking Riemann sums. They don't, have, they don't all have to be midpoint sums or left-hand sums. So the bigger point is that left-hand sums, right-hand sums, and midpoint sums are just special cases of Riemann sums. Now a very obvious question is, what's the point of arbitrary Riemann sums? Why on earth would you want to use such a thing? Well, there's a practical value. Sometimes you only have access to irregular information. So maybe you're drawing data from the real world and you don't have information at equal subintervals. Maybe you just have to use what you've got. And in that case, you might be forced to use an irregular partition to evaluate your Riemann sum. There's also a great theoretical value in these gadgets, as we shall see in future lessons. Using arbitrary Riemann sums really makes it easy for us to prove some very important theorems. Let's get straight the notion of a decorated partition. This is just a shorthand way of saying we have a partition of an interval, so we've chosen subintervals. But not only that, we've chosen our decorations, so to speak, the, the sampling arguments. So, if a partition has these decorations, we might call this whole thing a decorated partition, which will just be a shorthand way of saying we've got sampling arguments and a partition. Maybe we'll give the whole thing a name. So in this case, if we said P is a decorated partition, it just means that somewhere lurking in the problem, we've got this information that we know where to evaluate the endpoints and the sampling arguments and so on. Now the reason we might want to have this kind of notation is because then if you have a function f and you have all the information in your decorated partition wrapped up in something we call it, we're calling p, then this notation could be used for the Riemann sum. And if you wanted to spell it out explicitly, it would look like this. Now let's talk about the size of a partition. What do we mean by size? So suppose you have a partition. We're going to define the size to be the width of the widest subinterval. So in this example below, we have all these subintervals, and you should be able to pick out the one that's the widest. It's right there. And that width is what we will call the size of P. And notice we're using sort of double absolute value bar markers to indicate the size. So the size of a partition is the width of the widest subinterval. Now suppose you've got a partition of an interval. You might think to yourself, well, if P has many subdivisions, then the Riemann sum is going to give you a good approximation to the signed area. But let's take a look at an example. What if you chopped up an interval this way, and then you calculated the Riemann sum associated to that partition? Well, you'll notice that the actual area under the curve doesn't really match up that well with our approximation. So what went wrong? Well, what went wrong was that the partition size was too big. I mean, just look at this one interval right here. It's way too wide. It didn't do a good job of approximating the area under the curve because it was just too big. So the existence of one stinker in the bunch really does in the whole Riemann sum, really. So it's not just how many subdivisions you have. Really, the way to think about it is, as long as the partition size is relatively small, then your Riemann sum should yield a good approximation. So in this example, we've got a smaller partition size because the, the widest interval is not nearly as wide as in the last example. And if you just compare the green area to the blue area under the curve, you can see, because of the cancellation above and below, this has got to be a much better approximation to the actual area. Now it's time for our big theorem of the video. It's going to require a little bit of a setup. So please just bear with me. Suppose f is continuous on the interval from a to b. If we build a sequence of decorated partitions, you're going to get along for the ride two other sequences of numbers. You can measure the partition sizes, and so you'll get a sequence of partition sizes. And you can also just calculate Riemann sums, so you'll get a sequence of numbers corresponding to those calculations as well. 
So a sequence of partitions yields two other sequences of numbers, the sequence of partition sizes and the sequence of Riemann sums. Now with this in mind, we're able to state the theorem. So suppose f is continuous on the interval from a to b, and you have a sequence of partitions whose partition size goes to zero. So in other words, they're becoming more and more efficient as you chop up the interval into more and more pieces. Under these circumstances, the limiting value of the Riemann sums actually exists. As a matter of fact, that number is what we wind up interpreting to be the signed area under the graph of f. There's a second part to this theorem, though, that's very important. And that second part of the theorem says, if you come up with some other sequence of partitions whose partition sizes go to zero, then, in fact, the limiting value of those Riemann sums also exists. But it's not going to give you a different number. It's going to give you the same number as before. In other words, the limiting value of Riemann sums just doesn't depend on the type of Riemann sums that you use. Now maybe this sounds a lot more complicated than it really is, so let's look at a simple example. Suppose you take a nice continuous function on the interval from A to B, and you use left-hand partitions, midpoint partitions, and right-hand partitions. So in other words, we're going to come up with three different sequences of partitions. So watch what happens as we let the number of divisions go to infinity. In each case, you get a sequence of partitions, but they're all heading towards the same place. So you can see that the Riemann sums you get are all heading towards one common limit. Now this limit is what we wind up calling the definite integral of the function f on the interval from a to b. And we're going to give it this symbol. And this quantity is what we are going to interpret to be the signed area under the graph of f. So it's time then to see the official definition. Suppose f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b. The definite integral, denoted by this symbol, is defined to be the common limiting value of all approximating Riemann sums as the partition size goes to zero. So there's our integral. It is defined to equal the limiting value of Riemann sums as the partition size goes to zero. Now we'll put quotes around this because in practice you don't actually take a partition size to zero, you look at a sequence of partitions for which this partition size goes to zero. And really in practice that might be midpoint sums or left hand sums or something like that. But in any case, that's our definition of the definite integral. And the number you get is what we take to be the signed area under the graph of f. Now this should look vaguely familiar to you because you've seen another definition using a limit, and that is the derivative is a limit of secant slopes. Now there is an analogy here, as we'll see in a moment. Because a key question you could have is, is this much work always required in order to evaluate a definite integral? It would be a real bummer if that's the case. And the answer is a resounding no. And this shouldn't come as a surprise, perhaps, because if you remember with derivatives, when you first learned that a derivative was a limit of secant slopes, you might have been fearful that you were going to have to calculate all sorts of limits of secant slopes every, one, every time you wanted a derivative. That turned out not to be true. There were all sorts of shortcuts, like the power rule, the chain rule, and so on, that allowed you to take derivatives quickly, thereby avoiding having to actually take limits of secant slopes. Same story here. To evaluate definite integrals, we are not typically going to have to evaluate limits of Riemann sums. We're going to be able to avoid that with all sorts of shortcuts. And those shortcuts are sort of the nature of the next few lessons.